Well, good morning. Casey and Amanda, you guys are sitting over here now. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, it's great to have everybody back again. It's so, again, nice to see faces, right, man? I mean, it's, it's a blessing. We're so glad to have everybody back. We're so thankful for everybody that's still watching online as well. But as I, I think about the church, I think outside these walls, and it seems like our world right now is on fire. Does anybody else feel that way? I mean, there's a lot going on in the world right now, right? And we must be careful. It's imperative that we don't let worldly attitudes take over our hearts during these tumultuous times. Let me encourage us to think about Colossians 3, 2, when we're thinking about how we handle this world right now. It says this, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Setting our minds on things above means we're, we're zealous for Christ, right? We're zealous for his glory. We're zealous for the things of Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, how we need our minds to be supernaturally transformed in Christ. We need our minds to be set on things above so we can be effective servants of Christ in our day. Then, we can give others Holy Spirit empowered wisdom that's from above, amen? Instead, instead of powerless, worldly opinions from below. And this sort of relates to our psalm today because our psalmist will find out became consumed with this world. And it led him to a crisis of faith. But as he became more desperate for help, he finally turned to God and God did a mighty work on him and gave him godly wisdom, godly understanding. So let's open our Bibles to, to Psalm 90, Psalm 73. Psalm 73, and I've entitled the message this morning, From Envying Others to Worshiping God. So as we begin, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, as the church. Father, I ask that we live our lives for your glory, that we worship you with passion like we've worshipped in song to you this morning. Help our lives to, to be lived out that way. I ask, Father, that you help us in our day to be lights in this dark world, to be people who are living for your glory, and as we look at Psalm 73, Father, I, help, I ask that you help us to truly grow to love you more like the psalmist does. We love and praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, Psalm 73, 1 starts by saying this. Surely, or the ESV says here, truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now I must say Asaph writes this this whole psalm looking backwards. He's he's writing this psalm after going through all of this, which means verse 1 is more of a concluding statement that he learned about God. As the literal translation of the first part of verse 1 would say literally in the Hebrew, truly God is always good to Israel. 
I mean, they may not sound like a big deal at first glance, but if we sort of ponder it, if we chew on it, it's quite an amazing statement of Asaph's faith. He's saying regardless of whatever happens to Israel, God is always good to Israel. I mean, think about that. Think about what Israel had endured. They had faced some real terrible times, many failures, natural disasters, and even enslavement. Israel, if we remember, was enslaved to Egypt for hundreds of years. And yet Asaph says confidently that God is always good to Israel. And this leads to point number one. God's always good to us. God's always good to us. As we start this morning, can we all agree with Asaph this morning? Man, you guys are already jumping ahead. Good. I don't know if you guys hear an echoey thing in here, John. Okay, I'm just making sure because it's, okay. Okay, but yes, okay, so you guys agree. God's always good to his children, but more specifically, can you say without a doubt, without hesitation, that God is good to you this morning? I guess it's sort of the same question, isn't it? Right? Regardless of the situations you face, regardless of the troubles that you're in, the suffering you've endured, we recognize this morning that God is always good to us. So I want us to say this together. God is always good to us. Here we go. God is always good to us. Boy, amen, children. Man, that's perfect. Good job, guys. All right, God is always good to us. Not sometimes, right? Not most of the time, but he is what? Always good. Amen. And this is what Asaph had to learn. He had to know without a doubt that God was always good to him. So God had to take Asaph what is known as spiritual school. I mean, if we're in Christ, then you've been in God's school of sanctification. Amen. Amen. It's not like any other school because God's school transforms us from the inside out. God literally works on us. We know the children's song, right? He's still working on me, right? Why don't we just turn to our neighbor and say, God's still working on me. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's still working on me. See, babe, babe, you got to remember that when I sin still. He's still working on me, okay? Right? But, well, God was still working on Asaph as we see some of the serious cracks in Asaph's faith. Listen to what it says in Psalm 73, too. This is where we begin to see the problem. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Asaph says, I almost slipped, which means he began to doubt. But it wasn't that he, he doubted God's existence. That's not what it was saying. It wasn't unbelief per se, but it was that he began to doubt God's goodness. And this was a big deal, considering Asaph was a priest of the Lord. But the question is, what caused the doubt in Asaph's life? What led Asaph to begin to question who God was? Well, let's read on to Psalm 73, 3, where we find the answer. It says this, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. We see here that he simply wanted the, what the wicked had, Right? It wasn't so much, oh boy, here we go again, John. But it wasn't so much about getting an equal amount of wealth. Do I just need to not have a microphone? Okay, keep going. But it wasn't so much about getting an equal amount of wealth and possessions per se. And this word for property 
is referring to a higher standard of life, a better quality of life. Asaph thought the wicked had the good life, right? In other words, Asaph idolized the supposed good life of the wicked. Asaph idolized the supposed good life of the wicked. Asaph describes the life of the wicked as we go on in our verses in Psalm 73 for by saying, They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common burden, burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Asaph says the wicked have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They don't have troubles or trials, and they don't have any problems. I mean, that sounds pretty accurate, right, about the wicked? No? No, that's not right, right? What we see is that Asaph is looking at the wicked with rose-colored glasses, right? They're, they're, they're so strong. I mean, they're, they're so healthy and wealthy. They're so blessed by God. But Asaph's not done yet, because if we skip down to Psalm 73, 12, Asaph sums up the life of the wicked by saying this, This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. I mean, really, how can Asaph have such an exaggerated view of the wicked? They're always Are we, they're always amassing wealth? How can Asaph be so wrong in his estimation about the wicked? And this leads to point number two. Envy blinds us with the greener grass syndrome. Let me say that again. Envy blinds us with the greener grass syndrome. So what does that actually look like in our day today? I mean, I could give a lot of examples. Like, for example, maybe it's a neighbor, right, who makes a lot of money and you think they don't have care in the world as they have more money than they know what to do with. Or maybe it's the woman whose friend's husband prays with her while hers does not. And instead of being happy for her friend's relationship, she's envious. Or maybe it's the teen who desperately wishes he was the popular kid in school because maybe he doesn't get much attention himself, right? Or maybe... I don't really know if this is a sin per se or this is really envy, but maybe you're envious of someone's height, right? Maybe you're sort of envious because maybe you're short, you know? Um, Casey is tall and I am short. I, I have to admit it right now, right? I mean, it just seems like he's so much, he's so much better off than me. I mean, the, he sees above the clouds, right? I mean, I mean, when he, his life is so much clearer from his perspective. I mean, when he preaches, you can see him over the pulpit, right? Thank you, Al. I do feel better about that. I won't say that, though. That's mean, right? Okay. Okay. I'm just kidding, but these examples reveal that envy is alive and well in 2020. It's not just an Asaph problem. It's not just an Old Testament problem. It's not just a Psalm 73 problem, but it's a common problem that all of us struggle with in our present day. I wonder if we struggle with envy this morning. Are we always wishing we had what others had, right? Are we thinking, oh, if I just had what so-and-so had, then my life would be complete, right? 
Lord, if I could just have the marriage or the children that so-and-so have, then my life would be happy. What we see here is that envy causes us to want or, or to crave or to idolize what others have to the point that we're not content with what God has given us. I mean, this is the attitude we see with Asaph. Listen to what he compares him, his own life to, the wicked. And by the way, if you guys ever get this figured out, I will happily put this down and switch. Just so you know, I'm not like putting any pressure on you. But Psalm 73, he, he goes on and shares what he feels about himself, right? Psalm 73, 13 and 14, he says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. Asaph says, I've been faithful to God all my life and what has it gotten me? Again, verse 14, all day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. I mean, wow. This is a priest of the Lord. You think Asaph was being tortured and mistreated daily by his response, right? But he's not. He's just looking at the wicked and seeing greener grass. He's only daydreaming about how amazing their life is and at the same time thinking how dreadful and bad his life is. If we compared Asaph's life to the wicked from a food standpoint, we would say that Asaph thinks he's eating fast food burgers every day, and they're not good fast food burgers either, while the wicked are living it up eating ribeye steaks. I mean, do we see how envy poisons us? How envy causes us to to sinfully compare ourselves to others? How envy causes us to not be thankful for what God has given us in the present moment we're in. But another good question to ask is what does envy do to our relationship with God? What does envy do to our relationship with God? I mean, going back to Asaph, how do you think he's feeling towards God when he's struggling with envy? I mean, how well do you think he's loving God? How well do you think he's actually worshiping God when he is full of envy? And of course, the answer is he's not, right? He's not loving God, nor is he worshiping God because he's too busy worshiping what other people have as he's focused on who? Himself, right? Himself. There's no room for God. And this leads to point number three. Envy is the fruit as pride is the root. Envy is the fruit And pride is the root. Or in other words, under envy is a heart full of pride. I mean, listen to the pride just dripping out of Asaph in Psalm 73, 13 and 14 again. He says this, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. And I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I've been afflicted. And every morning brings new punishment. I mean, he's a priest of God. And he's playing the victim card with God. 
Woe is me. I've been so faithful to you, God. I've been so good to you, God. And it's been for what? It's been for nothing, obviously. It's been in vain because every day, all I go through is suffering and pain and agony in my life. What we see here is that Asaph thinks too much about his own goodness. He was too impressed with his own own righteousness. Which led him to believe that his faithfulness somehow earned God's gift and blessings. It wasn't, thank you, God, for saving a sinner like me. It wasn't, thank you, God, for pouring your grace out on a nobody like me. It wasn't, thank you, God, for choosing me when I deserve nothing. But instead, Asaph thought, you know what, God, you're pretty blessed to have a guy like me on your team. I mean, how ugly. How arrogant. How delusional to think somehow he deserves something from God. Proverbs 16, 18 reminds us that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And it's interesting because what did Asaph say about himself at the beginning of Psalm, the beginning of the Psalm? Listen back to Psalm 73, 2. He says this, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Asaph almost fell again. Pride goes before the fall. And similarly, God loves us too much to continue to let hidden pride control us as well. Because when we're prideful, we're full of self instead of God. When we're prideful, we're focused on our own goodness instead of God's goodness. When we're prideful, we think little of God's grace and think much about our own good works. When we're prideful, we live for ourselves instead of God. When we're prideful, we're not grateful to God, but demanding of him. When we're prideful, we're living in unrepentant sin, rebellion against God. When we're prideful. Oh, how pride is so dangerous, brothers and sisters. Pride is one of those sins that often goes unoverlooked, right? That often goes unnoticed in the church life. You know, we're pretty big on like addictions or sexual sin, but so much, often, so often pride goes unnoticed. So the question is, what do we do when we're prideful? What do we do when we're full of envy? Well, I would ask you, what did Asaph do? How did he deal with his envy and pride? Well, let's go back to our text and find out in Psalm 73, 16. He says this, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Asaph is saying, when I tried to figure out my problem, when I tried to to figure out why I was so envious of the wicked, when I tried to make sense of it all, I couldn't do it on my own. And then we finally get where the change actually occurred for Asaph. Psalm 73, 17. It should be music to our ears. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. Asaph says he he went into the sanctuary of God, and some commentaries and, and some theologians may think this is metaphorical or poetic here, but we can take it literally because he was actually a priest of the Lord, as we mentioned. So he would actually go into the sanctuary of God often. He was a priest. But on this occasion, something happened. He encountered God, and this is where he turned from envying the wicked. 
So I ask you, what, what's the antidote to envy? How do we, like Asaph, deal with sins like pride and envy? Well, I think the answer is clear, right? We need to have an encounter with God like Asaph. Now, I'm not saying this from that sort of charismatic, magical experience sort of encounter. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we turn to God because we're desperate for him. I mean, that's what we saw with Asaph, right? Verse 16, he tried to deal with this problem on his own, and he struggled, he was confused, and out of desperation, he finally turned to who? He turned to, turned to God, right? He turned to God. But some of us might be thinking, what does it actually look like to turn to God, right? Right? That may not be very clear. Well, James gives us clarity what it actually looks like in James 4, 8 through 10. Now, we have to remember when we read something from James, it's a general epistle, which means it went throughout all the churches. So this was general truth for all the churches in that area. So it says this, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash you, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Green, gr- grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will will lift you up. We see here that James says coming near to God means we're confessing our sin. We're submitting ourselves under God's authority. In other words, when we turn to God, we're simultaneously turning away from self. Let me say that again. When we turn To God, we're simultaneously turning to self. And if I had my other hand, I would move it this way. You know what we're really talking about here? We're talking about old fashioned repentance. This is old fashioned repentance. And this leads to point number four repentance is the cure for pride and envy. Repentance is the cure for pride and envy. But I'm afraid in our modern high-tech society, repentance may sound a little archaic, a little out of style, but I must assure all of us, I must encourage us that God's word, God's ways, God's solutions never goes out of style, amen? So repentance is the supernatural solution to our sinful problems. Oh, I wish there was a way that I could get rid of my ungodly pride. Or, oh, I wish I could stop being ruled by envy and jealousy. Oh, I wish I could stop being ruled by my addictions. Or, oh, I wish I could stop being controlled by anger or being controlled by my tongue. Or, I wish I could grow in holiness. Oh, I wish I wouldn't be so legalistic and self-righteous. Well, brothers and sisters, I have some wonderful news. If we're in Christ, God transforms us when we repent. So let me just give us an example of practicing repentance. Let's see, let's say I see that I'm envious of the wicked like Asaph, and I've been dealing with envy for a couple of months, and I and I turn to God knowing it's it's wrong that I'm not content with what he gives me? Because I know it's wrong to always want what other people have. So I repent, 
right? Which means it entails first confessing my sin of envy to God and asking forgiveness for daydreaming about how good the wicked have it, and then on the other end, thinking how bad I have it. And instead of envy, I begin to praise God and thank him for all the rich blessings he's given me. That would be an example of repentance. As I put off envy, I put on thankfulness and worship to God. I mean, that's unbelievable. Repentance is an awesome blessing. It's a grace of God that God has given to all of us in Christ Jesus. I would ask you, if you're in Christ, are you daily walking in repentance? Are you so wanting to please God with your life that you're consistently repenting of sins like fear, worry, anger, lust, pride, addictions, etc.? Brothers and sisters, may we practice this gift from God called repentance. But going back to our text, we left off where Asaph was struggling with envy towards the wicked, right? And he walked into the sanctuary of God and everything changed in his life in that moment, right? Again, Psalm 73, 17 says, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Asaph says here, what we see is that when he went to the sanctuary of God, he, he felt better, right? Or he went to the sanctuary of God and was encouraged. Wait, that's not exactly it either. Or does it say all his troubles and struggles just went away when he went into the sanctuary of God? And of course, the answer is no, right? Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I, what? Understood. Then I understood. What we see here is that God gave Asaph understanding. He learned something when he met God. Brothers and sisters, I'm afraid that many people aren't looking for understanding when they go to church. But instead, they want an experience with God. They want to ease their troubled minds. They want God to just make them feel better. They want to have some sort of emotional high, right? Oh, the music makes me feel so good. And Matt, I don't know where you're at, but it does, I mean, it is good. I mean, it is great. It does make us feel good. Or the pre preaching is so uplifting, especially when Casey's preaching, right? Right? I just get good vibes when I come to family church, right? And that's great, but that's not the ultimate goal because our main purpose, our highest desire is that Christ is exalted, that Christ is magnified through song, through preaching, through prayer. And our second goal is that as a people, we grow and mature in our faith. And that happens when we gain understanding about God, when we gain understanding about ourselves, and we gain understanding about the next life. And this leads to point number five. When we encounter God, he gives us understanding. When we encounter God, he gives us understanding. God gave Asaph insight into understanding the wicked himself and God. That's what we see in the rest of our text. In the rest of what he says next, he, gives, he gets understanding. So God gives Asaph understanding first about the wicked. Turn with me to Psalm 73, 17 through 20. It says this, Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their destiny talking about the wicked, surely you place them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors? They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. 
And this leads to understanding number one. The wicked's high life is momentary. The wicked's high life is momentary. Asaph understands the end of the wicked. He goes from envying the wicked to now feeling sorry for the wicked. The surface level success, the deception of worldly riches, the distraction of immediate gratification means nothing as Asaph sees the final destiny of the wicked. Asaph sees that God sets the wicked in slippery places. And in the end, he will destroy them as they're swept away by terrors. I mean, brothers and sisters, this should give us chills. This should horrify us because those without Christ face the same fate. Those who haven't turned to Christ in repentance and faith are headed towards destruction. These are people that we know. These are people that we love. They're friends. They're family. They're co-workers, etc., I wonder if God this morning has given us an understanding of what will happen to all those who don't know Christ. I mean, we're talking about eternal destruction. Do we feel a sense of urgency to reach our friends or our family members or our neighbors for Christ? Are we praying for them? Are we building relationships with them? Are we sharing Christ with them? I would say that I know that many of us are passionate about sharing Christ with others, right? I think of, I think of Michael and Deborah Passero. I think of Casey and Amanda. I think of Ralph. And I think of many others that are doing that. But for others of us, we need to share the good news. We need to walk through our fear and share the amazing news of Christ Jesus to the lost. Amen? I got one amen out of that. Silas, thank you. Thank you. There we go. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. One adult. That's good. So may we have understanding, right? Like Asaph here, that compels us to share the love of Christ with others. Well, then God gives Asaph understanding of himself. Psalm 73, 21 and 22. Asaph says this, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was, a, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Asaph saw himself clearly, finally, right? And what a difference compared to what he said earlier. Remember what he said earlier, Psalm 73, 13 and 14. This is what Asa says. Surely in vain, I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. Verse 14, all day long, I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishment. You can hear the, the self-righteousness just oozing out of him at the beginning, right? As he has this high view of himself. I mean, we would say that Asaph has high self-esteem in the beginning, right? In the beginning. If you went to a psychologist, the psychologist would have said, man, you are so healthy. You think so highly of yourself. You think you're so good. That's perfect, right? And then Psalm 73, 21 through 22, after he walks into the sanctuary of God, he says this, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was a senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. He sees who he really was. He examines himself correctly. He says, I was ignorant 
and he compares himself to an animal. That acts out of instinct, right? I mean, his self-esteem, his high, wonderful self-esteem is destroyed. It's utterly ruined. He's at the end of himself as he sees his sin of envy. I mean, you can see that Asaph has a repentant heart. And this leads to understanding number two. When we look at God, we begin to see ourselves correctly. I mean, think about it. As I turn to God and see his glory, I see his magnificence and his holiness begins to shine down on me. It brings to light my darkness, my sinfulness, my wickedness, and I begin to see myself accurately. I see myself as I really am for the first time. And it causes me to recognize my utter need for Christ every day. I wonder this morning, what's your view of yourself? I wonder if we recognize that we're a sinful mess as people and our only hope every day is Christ. Let me ask you this. If you see that you're sinful or in desperate need of Christ every day, or do you see yourself as good and self-reliant? Brothers and sisters, what a blessing it is to know that we're accepted wholly by God, even though God knows how truly bad we are, right? And yet we're saved by the blood of Christ. Amen? Well, this leads to the last way Asaph receives understanding as he sees God correctly, which we see in Psalm 73, 23 through the end with verse 28. But for time's sake, let me just read Psalm 73, 25 and 26, which says this. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I mean, what a difference. He's passionately praising God as his envious heart has been transformed into a heart that now fully worships God. And this leads to understanding number three, our last understanding. When we are emptied of self, then God will fill us with himself. When we're emptied of pride, emptied of our lust, emptied of our selfish pursuits, emptied of this world as again we're, we're looking at, at God and, and then we're ready to be filled with, with his holiness, with his joy, with his love, with the empowerment by his spirit. But ultimately what we're filled with, with is God himself. He becomes our passion. He becomes our pursuit, our joy above all other joys. We, we can't stop talking about him. We can't Stop reading his word and spending time with him on our knees in prayer. This is what we see in the life of Asaph. This is what we see in Psalm 73. We we see a man who goes from a heart of pride and envy to a heart filled with thankfulness and worship. May we learn from Asaph This morning, may his words become our words when he says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can find so much wisdom, so much knowledge about you in your word, Father. In one psalm, we learn so much about you. We learn so much about ourselves. We we learn so much about this world in general, Father. We learn what our purpose is here. As Asaph went from envying you to utterly falling on his knees in worship and thankfulness to you, Father, I ask that you help us to be a body of believers like this. But not only our church, I ask that you do a work in all the churches that are walking in your word in that way, that we would be passionate, that revival would occur in your church and around the world today. Father, we thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen.